I begin this morning. Let's join our hearts and our minds together so we can hear the Spirit of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, indeed, we are so thankful to be able to gather here in your house to hear your words of life, Lord. We're thankful for your Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life that we may hear these words, that we may be saved. Lord, we ask you now to speak through Corey. Lord, just lift him up and let the Spirit just flow. Through the songs that we'll be singing, Lord, we just ask for blessings that it'll go out from here and we'll share these words of life with those around us. They'll see that joy in our hearts. They'll see the love in our hearts, and they'll want to join. So help us, Lord, this day to praise your name in a way that's pleasing to you. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. Would you please stand and join us as we open up with singing about how marvelous our Savior is. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus of Nazarene And wonder how he could love me A sinner condemned unclean Singing how marvelous, how wonderful in my soul took my sins and my sorrows they made him his very own he bore the burden to calvary and suffered and died alone singing how marvelous His face I at last shall see It will be my joy through the ages To sing of His love for me Singing how marvelous, how wonderful in my song Shall ever be how marvelous, how For me, singing how marvelous, how wonderful in my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Follow along with me as we read Psalm 148, <clears throat> verses 10 and 12, and, or 12 and 13, I'm sorry. Kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above the earth and heaven. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light And darkness tries to hide Trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. Oh, see how great, how great is our God. In 
stretch to where she stands. In time, is in his hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The God in three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, light. psalm of praise from chapter 66. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face Christ, 
is death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know. have paid my ransom. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know. This wound have paid my ransom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come and worship you, and most of all for the wounds that paid our ransom, and that we can come here knowing that we are free and forgiven, and with the sole purpose of worshiping you and you alone. Just thank you again for this time today. Please be with Pastor Corey as he brings us the message. Allow everything that we say and do to be pleasing and honoring to you. We thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Good morning. Thank you, Casey, Melissa. Wonderful job. Thank you all for lifting your voices and singing with us this morning. I'm going to get you active here early. So by a quick show of hands, how many of you have ever owned or ridden in a car that seemed to give you nothing but problems? It's like as soon as you took it in to get one thing fixed, another thing would break and you'd be right back to square one, wouldn't you? You know, I once owned a small pickup truck. And at completely random times, without no input or cause from me, and most often at times when I would least expect it, the windshield wiper fluid would start spraying on its own. And then the windshield wipers would start moving back and forth to clean it off. And after many instances of trial and error, I figured out that the only way to get the wipers to turn off and for the fluid to stop spraying was to manually turn the wipers on and then turn them back off again. That would finally get things to calm down. But if you flash forward some 25 years or so, now my current car has so many gadgets, so many sensors, that now my windshield wipers, they will turn on automatically as soon as it detects drops of water hitting my windshield. I could go by a sprinkler, it could hit me, and psh, all, it starts going. It's pretty cool, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I love my car. Needless to say, the, the car I have now is far superior, far more advanced compared to the old pickup truck that I drove when I was a teenager. In fact, if we were to do a side-by-side -side comparison, there would be no contest as to which vehicle was better. And I bring up this example today because in our anchor passage for this morning's message, we're going to find Jesus comparing and contrasting his style of selfless and sacrificial servant leadership against the leadership of the Pharisees, which he will describe as harmful and predatorial. Jesus is going to share with us why he should be the one that we follow and what benefits we receive by believing in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. So if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I invite you to open them to the Gospel of John, chapter 10, and we'll be reading verses 7 through 21. John, chapter 10, verses 7 through 21. It will be helpful to keep in mind that Jesus is likely still speaking to a crowd that includes the Pharisees and the religious leaders who, if you remember, had just excommunicated the man who was born blind but had recently been healed by Jesus. And it was in response to their actions, to their failed leadership, 
that Jesus tells this parable. Join with me this morning as I read John 10, verses 7 through 21. The word of God reads, So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, he has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Let's pray together this morning. Gracious God and Father, how wonderful it is, how blessed we are to know the love and the care and the leadership of the Good Shepherd. Lord, as we study this passage today, may we understand the message that Jesus was seeking to communicate to this audience. And may we view Jesus and comprehend his leadership with accuracy and appreciation. Thank you, God, for sending your son to lay down his own life for us, the sheep. May we respond to such mercy and grace with submission to your will and with gratitude for your love. We ask this all in the precious and holy name of Christ our Lord and in one heart, one spirit, one voice, all of God's people said, amen, amen. Last week, as we began our study of John chapter 10, we looked at a, a shorter parable that Jesus told in order to condemn the leadership style and the leadership failures of the Pharisees and the scribes of Israel. And by telling this parable, Jesus was intentionally contrasting their insufficiencies, their abuses of power against the leadership of Israel's true shepherd, who is known intimately by the sheep, who calls the sheep by name, who leads them out from the sheepfold, and who leads them from in front so as to protect the flock from danger. And in verse 6 of chapter 10, John tells us that the crowd of religious leaders, they, they didn't understand what Jesus was saying. So in our anchor passage from this morning in verses 7 through 21, we now find Jesus elaborating on, expounding on this parable and this comparison of Israel's shepherds. After describing the Pharisees and the scribes as both thieves and robbers, we see in verse 8 and in verse 10 that Jesus wasn't done with his description of their leadership. He says to them, all who came before me, meaning all the false leaders who had tried to exploit and to take advantage of Israel before Christ's arrival, all who came before me, again, are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not listen to them. Verse 10 now says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. This very descriptive language being employed by Jesus, it establishes a, a baseline for us of, of what both human and self-righteous leadership will look like. 
As we discussed last week, those who see people as tools or as props to take advantage of for their own benefit and for their own gain, those people are not leaders, but they are predators. And I think we can support this interpretation by looking at the words that Jesus uses here to describe them. He says they steal, they kill, and they destroy. That's the type of damage that false leaders and false shepherds will cause. Both in, but in Jesus' expansion and elaboration of his original parable found in the rest of these verses, we're going to see what true Christ-like leadership really looks like. We're going to discover four important blessings that Jesus, as the shepherd of Israel and as the Lord of our lives, gives to us, his sheep. In a good old Baptist preacher fashion, I've made a list where every item starts with the same letter. It's worth a shot. Maybe it'll help you guys remember it. I don't know. But the first blessing that we receive from Jesus as our shepherd and our Lord is protection. Okay, Jesus protects his sheep. Let's look together again this morning at verse 7. Here Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Now for those of us who are city slickers and soft hands like myself, thank you, this description given by Jesus, it doesn't immediately resonate with me. Okay, I mean, I, I understand how a door works. Right? A, a door keeps in what you want to keep in, and it keeps out what you want to keep out. But what does a door have to do with Jesus? What does a door have to do with sheep and with leadership? Well, I want you to listen to this story that I found in a commentary series by Kent Hughes. He mentions a renowned Old Testament scholar by the name of Sir George Adam Smith. I think he was British. And George Smith was doing some traveling, and he, he and his guide, they came across a shepherd. And they began to have a conversation with him. And, and Hughes writes this, he says, The man showed him the fold into which the sheep were led at night. It consisted of four walls with a way in. Sir George said to him, That is where they go at night? Yes, said the shepherd. And when they are in there, they are perfectly safe. But there is no door said Sir George. I am the door, said the shepherd. He was not a Christian man. He was not speaking in the language of the New Testament. He was speaking from the Arab shepherd's point of view. Sir George looked at him and said, what do you mean by the door? Said the shepherd, when the light has gone and all the sheep are inside, I lie in the open space and no sheep ever goes out but across my body. And no wolf comes in unless he crosses my body. I am the door. So as we look back now on Jesus' own self-proclamation of being the door, we can think of him as the shepherd who protects the sheep from wandering astray from the safety of the fold. We can think of him as the guard who keeps out the wolves who have harmful intentions for the sheep. Allegorically speaking, no true sheep, no authentic follower of Jesus can ever get misplaced and find him or herself permanently lost and outside the fold. Nor does a true Christian ever have to worry about wolves and charlatans and predators ever getting into what Jesus has designed to keep them out. As followers of Christ, we have a promise of protection by Jesus. Now, this doesn't mean that in this world we won't ever have times of struggle or chaos or pain or even doubt. It doesn't mean that we will never encounter predators or false shepherds who will try to harm us or to take advantage of us. But what it does mean is that from an eternal standpoint, from an eternal perspective, Christ is always protecting us. That he is always with us through these challenges. Jesus is the door. He is the shepherd over whose body a sheep must cross in order to leave the fold. And he is the shepherd over whose body a wolf must attempt to cross to gain access to the sheep. And I don't know about you all, but I can't think of a better, more powerful shepherd to give me his protection than Jesus. This leads us now to the second blessing that we receive from him as our shepherd and Lord, which is provision. In verse 9, Jesus says again, I am 
the door. But then he, he adds a little more information after this second announcement. He says, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. One of the responsibilities of a professional shepherd is to fulfill for his sheep, is, is to find healthy and plentiful grass for them to feed on. This means that he has to go out and scout the land to to survey the vegetation to make sure that the place where he is leading them is sufficient to nourish and to benefit the flock. Jesus says that as the door, anyone who is allowed entrance by him into the sheepfold will also be allowed to go out and pasture where Jesus has scouted. And what I think we are to take away from this portion of the parable is that as followers of Jesus and as people who have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in our hearts, Jesus will make sure that our walk with him is one that provides for us spiritual growth and spiritual health. This means that Jesus will ensure that what we experience and what we go through will never be wasted. It will never be solely for our harm. Only Jesus, who is God in the flesh, can take the challenges and the disappointments and the pain of this life. And only he can use them to conform us more and more to his own image. This is a promise of provision and growth that Jesus gives to all of his sheep. And if we follow him, if we trust in him, if we submit to his leadership, to his authority, then we will find spiritual maturity and spiritual health in all situations. So far, we've seen that Jesus will provide the blessings of protection and provision for those who follow him as their shepherd and their Lord. But as we continue to read, we'll see that the third blessing we receive is propitiation. If you were with us for our Easter service a few weeks ago, you'll remember that we talked about the word propitiation. As we discussed the resurrection of Jesus serving as proof that Jesus' death on the cross was accepted by God to serve as our substitutionary death to sin. And we defined the word propitiation to be a sufficient and acceptable offering that satisfies the wrath of a deity. And as we look now at verses 11 through 13, I think that we should be reading into Jesus' words this understanding of divine justice and what we call penal substitution. Starting in verse 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd does what he lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Now, in these three verses, we have two different descriptions going on, don't we? Jesus is talking about himself in one manner, and then he talks about the Pharisees and the false leaders of Israel in another. Of the false leaders, Jesus says to them, they don't truly care about the sheep because the sheep don't really belong to them. So at the first sign of danger, at the first hint of difficulty, the hired hand, he'll run away. Because the hired hand cares more about and loves himself more than he loves the sheep. He's only there for a paycheck. He only cares about the sheep as far as they provide a benefit to him. But in Jesus, we see a completely different type of relationship. In Jesus, we have a shepherd who is good as compared to the bad shepherding of the Pharisees. And this good shepherd does not lead the flock for his own selfish gain and personal profit. Now the good shepherd is willing to lay down his own life for the benefit of the sheep. Instead of loving himself more than the flock, Jesus loves the flock more than he loves his own life. So when Jesus says that he's willing to lay down his life for the sheep, we need to know what threat Jesus is promising to give up his life for. And that threat, as scripture tells us, is the curse of sin. The certainty of eternal judgment and the sting of death. Jesus, the good shepherd, the son of God, laid down his own life as a sacrifice for our sin so that the wrath and the punishment that we earned might be satisfied in him. And the justice that a holy and righteous and perfect God demands would be served and would be satisfied 
through Jesus Christ. This is how Jesus laid down his life for the sheep. He didn't have to do it. He didn't go through with it because it benefited or profited him. He did it because without it, no sheep could ever be saved. No sheep could ever have eternal life. Jesus satisfied the righteous and just wrath of God so that we wouldn't have to. And in my book, that is an incredible and gracious blessing that I, for one, could never deserve. This leads us now to the fourth and final blessing that we receive if we follow Jesus as our shepherd and as our Lord. That is perseverance. Now the word perseverance can take on a couple of different meanings. In, in one sense, it can mean a steady persistence in adhering to an action, a belief, or a purpose. It's often synonymous with the concept of steadfastness. But the sense in which I'm using it this morning is of the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. But before we dig in on that, let's look at verses 14 through 16 from our anchor text. Jesus states, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. Here we see Jesus talking about a relationship with his flock that mirrors or parallels in some way his own relationship with God the Father. Now think about that for, for just a minute. Jesus says that the way that I know my sheep and the way that my sheep know me, that shares qualities or characteristics in how God the Father knows God the Son. And how God the Son knows God the Father. Of what sense could he be talking about? Well, we know that God the Father loves the Son. And he delights in the Son. We also know that the Son loves the Father and is committed to accomplishing his will and bringing glory to his name. So what I think that we can draw from this is that Jesus' relationship with us and in turn our relationship with Jesus is one of love. It's one of commitment one of assurance, and it's one of closeness. Jesus knows his sheep. And graciously and, and mercifully, God has made it so that the sheep can intimately and salvifically and, and perseveringly know Christ. And as we discussed a little bit earlier, when Jesus described himself as the door to the sheepfold, not only must a wolf or a predator come across Jesus to try and make their way into the fold, but a sheep must also cross over Jesus in order to find their way out. And as Jesus cannot be overcome by any enemy or a wolf, a wandering sheep cannot possibly slip by Jesus' love and attention and observation. And because of Jesus knowing his sheep and because of Jesus being attentive to his sheep, he will never lose one of his own. And this is why we can say that all true believers and, and followers of Christ will persevere or remain in the faith until they are called home. In the Baptist Faith and Message Statement of 2000, which is the statement of faith that our church holds to, Article 5 on God's Purpose of Grace, it reads like this. It says, all true believers endure to the end. Those whom God has accepted in Christ and sanctified by His Spirit will never fall away from the state of grace, but shall persevere to the end. Believers may fall into sin through neglect and temptation, whereby they grieve the Spirit, impair their graces and comforts, and bring reproach on the cause of Christ and temporal judgments on themselves. Yet they shall be kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. And if you were to look at the Baptist faith and message statement, if you were to look at some of the verses that our statement of faith cites as supports for this doctrine, you will see some verses from John chapter 10. In fact, next week we're going to read some, some more words from Jesus where he repeats the knowledge and the intimate relationship that he has with the sheep. And he'll say in verse 28, I give them eternal life and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. 
And my point from all of this is that as our shepherd and as our leader, one of the great blessings that we receive from Jesus is knowing that despite our proneness to wander, despite our temptation for sin and selfishness, our salvation is not dependent upon us, the sheep, to hold on to Jesus. On the contrary, our salvation rests in Jesus' ability and in his power to know and to love and to hold on to us. And since Jesus is God, we never have to fear that he will leave us or forsake us. We never have to worry that we might slip through the door of the sheepfold without him knowing. You see, Jesus is the door. Jesus is the good shepherd. And once we are his, he will never lose us. He will never let us go. Now, while we must concede that Jesus may have been speaking in this parable primarily about the people of Israel, I want you to note what he says in verse 16 when he says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. I think that we can say unmistakably that Jesus is talking about the Gentiles, the non-Jews, whom would be grafted into God's kingdom after Jesus' death and resurrection. From this we should see that Jesus knows specifically and definitively those who are his sheep. He knows for certain those who are not his. And if you have repented of your sin, if you have placed your trust and your faith in Christ Jesus and in him alone, for forgiveness and for salvation, you can rest assured that you are one of his sheep. And you can rejoice in the fact that as one of his flock, he will protect you. He will provide for you. He will be the propitiation for your sins. And he will keep you and allow you to persevere in the faith until the end. And as one of his sheep myself, I know it may sound a bit biased, but And those four things are blessings for which I am incredibly grateful. You see, that's the kind of shepherd and leader that I want to follow. My prayer for you today is that hopefully you are following Jesus too. And that you now have a better understanding of all that we receive from following Christ as our Lord and as our good shepherd. So as we move on now into our time of application, what is it that we can take away from Jesus' message here to the crowd of religious leaders? Well, most obviously, Jesus is telling us that in general, the leadership of the Pharisees was harmful, while his leadership is loving and good. But I think that we can find something even more helpful and more applicable than that. And as I pondered over this passage, it it struck me as as to how Jesus used this parable and this imagery of sheep and shepherds to make that comparison and that contrast between the religious leaders of Israel and himself. And it got me to start thinking about how followers of Christ are to be compared and contrasted to the people and to the ideologies of the world around us. We know that Scripture has not called us to remove ourselves from the world. We know that we are not called to blend in with or to look just like everyone else of the world. Now, Our our calling, as Peter mentions in his first letter, is to proclaim the excellencies of God to abstain from the passions of the flesh, and to keep our conduct honorable so that when our enemies and when unbelievers speak against us, what will show up against their hatred are the good deeds that we have done for God in response to our salvation and our sanctification. Peter says that when, we, they, when they see our good deeds, the lost people of the world, they may even come to glorify God on the day of visitation. What I'm trying to lead us to this morning is the idea that just as Jesus' leadership qualities and his care for the sheep contrasted brightly and sharply against the failed leadership and against the exploitations of the Pharisees, so too are the lives of believers to contrast significantly and unmistakably against the lives and the actions and the selfishness of the lost people around us. And this contrast from our lives is meant to serve two distinct purposes. First, it helps to prove to ourselves that the regeneration of our hearts and that the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives is actually helping us to become more and more like Jesus each and every day. I like to say that Jesus doesn't remove us out of the world. 
but he sure is working to begin removing the world out of us. Our lives, our changes, our growth serve as validation and as a testimony to God's saving power and to the truth of his gospel message. But the second purpose for the contrasting nature of our Christian behavior is to point the world to the shepherd who saved us and who is transforming us. As Christians, we want others to know Christ in the same way that we do. But if our language and our actions and our selfishness and our tendencies to use others for our own gain, if that's all that people see when they look at us, what kind of evidence for salvation and transformation are they really observing? Our everyday lives, though never perfect, never fully sinless on this side of eternity, our everyday lives should stand out brightly compared to what people expect to see from other human beings in the world. You see, people expect to encounter selfishness. People expect to encounter exploitation and abuse and greed. People expect to encounter venom and harshness and impatience. But you see, in Christ, we have both the power and the opportunity to show the world the very opposite of what they have come to expect. And when we are able to demonstrate to people the opposite of what they expect to receive, and honestly the opposite of what they themselves would likely do, then we've now begun to show them the grace and the power and the glory of God as his representatives and his lights to a darkened world. That's what Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, verse 16. Let your light shine before others so that they, meaning non-believers, may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So if we walk away with anything from today's message, let's remember that Jesus is the door and the good shepherd who offers protection, provision, propitiation, and perseverance. And let's remember the contrast that Jesus showed to the Pharisees, to the other leaders of Israel, it's the same kind of contrast that we are to demonstrate in our own lives. In this way, God is glorified. In this way, the power of the gospel is verified. And in this way, the people of God, the sheep who are part of Jesus' flock, will serve as living ambassadors, and will serve as billboards for the shepherd who offers us so many blessings. Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, as we look at Jesus' discussion with those Pharisees, with those men who were attempting to lead the nation of Israel, Lord, we, we see that in their human nature and in their fallen nature, they, they were predators. They led in a harmful way because they did not love the sheep. The sheep did not belong to them. But Lord, you sent your son Jesus and he is the door of the sheep. He is the good shepherd. Lord, we belong to Jesus. For that we are grateful. Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you provide through faith in Christ Jesus. We thank you for the protection, the provision. Thank you that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. And thank you for the perseverance that we have, that you will hold us, that you will keep us until the end. Lord, if there's someone here this morning who has heard those blessings but has never felt that, has never understood what it means to be loved and led by a selfless and sacrificial leader and shepherd, Lord, I pray that they would want to know more. I pray that you would touch their hearts right now, that they would want to know more about Jesus, that they would want to know how Jesus and his perfect life and his sacrificial death and his resurrection from the grave how that all works together to provide for us eternal life. And Lord, I pray that you would give them courage this morning to maybe just tap someone on the shoulder around them and say, hey, can you share more with me about Jesus? Lord, for those of us who are followers of Christ, I pray that we would be strengthened, that we would be encouraged about the blessings that we have through our faith in Christ. But Lord, I pray that we would also be challenged and convicted to live our lives in a way that is different from the world. Lord, we don't want to hide away. We don't want to separate ourselves from the world. In that way, they can't see us. But also, we don't want to blend in with the world because in that way, they can't see us. 
Lord, we want to live in a way that testifies to your glory and your righteousness and your holiness and your love so that the world will see us and in seeing us, they will see Christ. Work in us, Father, to grow in Christ's likeness. Work in us to be more and more like him every day so that we can show the world the good shepherd who has saved and loved us. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We thank you for today. We ask all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. We are blessed, aren't we? How reassuring is it to, to hear about and sing about the, the loving shepherd that we serve. Would you please stand and join us as we, we take this time to respond with amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour Father God, indeed we are so thankful, Lord, to hear your word today. We're so thankful for your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, who indwells within us and gives us the guidance in a world who so many voices are telling us this is right and that is right and this is wrong and that is wrong. We know what is right because you do not change. You are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And Lord, help us to stand as witnesses when we hear those voices that are telling us things are wrong or things are right, that we know the truth and help us to share that with those around us and they will see your love and your life. And this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ who gave it all for us. In his name we pray. Amen.